No. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you my little my, my Toronto to my, um, oh, my little Toronto link. They're linked link. to my synagogue. That's right. Yeah, right. yeah, my husband knew that. And I also went to the MGB. Which one? No worries. Well, uh, and so but see, you're, you're, you're a lot younger. Younger. you're a lot younger, but that was my link because that camp in particular was in the same camp. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Elliot, so yeah, so. Thing on my resume is unprofessional. 
Have you been saying Good. Something I'm, I'm committed to. Oh. Hey, how are you, Delta? Hey, I'm Delta. Hey, nice to meet you. Hey, oh, yeah, I think we're military. Oh, 
interesting parts where, yeah, I start in about a minute so people could get their food and sit down. So I'm uh, Dr. Anita Palpu. I'm the division head for general internal medicine and I'm honored to be the chair of this lectureship. Uh, and we're very grateful to Dr. Um, Arthur Dodak for establishing this lectureship. Um, as many of you know, Dr. Dodek was a clinical and interventional cardiologist here at St. Paul's from 1972 to 2008, 
and during his distinguished career, he was the one who performed the first coronary angioplasty in 1980, and also the first balloon valvuloplasty in 1985. Um, he's had parallel interests in medical ethics, and he's also published in this area over his career. He was a chair of the College of Physician Surgeons of BC Ethics Committee, and he also served as the organization's president from 2007 to 9. So this lectureship was established in gratitude for his positive experience here at St. Paul. So we are also enormously grateful for uh, this lectureship and this opportunity to bring world-renowned speakers to um, present to us. So I would like to now segue into introducing our speaker. We are very delighted to start our academic grand rounds uh, year with our inaugural, inaugural lecturer, Dr. Schiffer Ginsburg. She's a professor of medicine and respirology at the University of Toronto and a scientist at the Wilson Center. She's also the director of the Elliott Philipson Clinical Educator Program and the director of the Education Research and Scholarship, both at the University of Toronto Department of Medicine. Her research program focuses on understanding how clinical supervisors conceptualize and assess and communicate about performance as well as competence of their learners. And she also has researched the understanding and evaluation of professionalism in medicine. So our committee reviewed many potential candidates and we unanimously agreed that Dr. Ginsburg was a perfect fit for these rounds. So please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Ginsburg. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. It is truly an honor to be here and I'm so happy that I got to meet Dr. Dodek and we realize important things like we went to the same summer camp system. Uh, may maybe not in the same year, but I'm not going to do the math. Um, I've also put up my uh, Twitter name up there so people can feel free to tweet either during or after if they have any questions. I wanted to start by mentioning some disclosures. Um, I do have some funding and I've done some consulting work with the organizations that you see here, as well as with a couple of the journals. I don't uh, think it's a conflict in that we're all really trying to do the same thing, but I thought I would mention it. But my real conflict is that I wrote this book with my former chair, Wendy Levinson, and with Fred Hafferty and Catherine Lucy, and I really do want you all to buy it full price on Amazon. Um, but I am using some uh, examples from the book. So the objectives for, for our time together is I was hoping to... Um, get everyone to understand the power of the hidden curriculum and how we contribute to it and what we might do about it. And to go through some of the difficulties we have in assessing professionalism in medicine and why those exist. And then also to generate discussion. So Fred Hafferty is a sociologist who studies medical uh, sorry, uh, medicine as a profession. And he does a lot of work in medical education. And he once wrote that professionalism has no meaningful existence independent of the interactions that give it form and meaning. There is great folly in thinking otherwise. And I really love this quote because he's reminding us that professionalism isn't a thing out there in the world that we can look at and examine. It's something that is created and co-created amongst the people that are participating in the system. And we always have to remember the dynamic nature of what that is. So I'm going to go through a few definitions, and you may already be familiar with these. So I'm sure you've heard of the formal curriculum. That's everything that we teach and everything that we're espousing. So the formal curriculum is embedded in mission statements, course objectives, course materials. It's really what we believe we're teaching and what we want students to learn. Now, the informal curriculum, on the other hand, is outside of the formal curriculum, and it can exist in a variety of settings, at the bedside, in the clinic, and what distinguishes it is that it's unscripted and predominantly ad hoc. So, for example, in the formal curriculum, you may learn all the proper anatomy of the knee and how to examine the knee, and then you go to the clinic and the resident says, oh, here's how I examine the knee. So that may be consistent or inconsistent with the formal curriculum, but it is unscripted. But the hidden curriculum is something entirely different. This refers to the lessons that are learned that are not explicitly intended. And they may be and often are contrary to what's in the formal curriculum. And as Fred Hafferty wrote, the hidden curriculum is embedded in the organizational structures 
and the culture and influences, and it influences the norms and values that students learn. And that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. So I'm going to start with an example, and um, we're going to work through a little bit of it together. So this was a course on patient-centered teaching. So this is the formal curriculum. First-year medical students are working in small groups with a patient, and the goal is to listen to the patient's story and then ask them questions. So in this group, there's two facilitators. One's a physician, one's a social worker. The physician starts by introducing himself and then inviting the patient to tell the students their story. Shortly after the patient starts talking, the physician surreptitiously palms his iPhone below the table and starts tapping away. And this continues for the duration of the patient's story. The social worker noticed but didn't say anything or attempt to bring him back into the discussion. And at the end, um, neither facilitator asked the students about their thoughts or reactions about the experience. So what do you think are some things that the students might have learned that were perhaps not intended. Yes. It's okay not to pay attention. It's yeah. okay to be rude. Yep. It's okay not to provide feedback. That's right. What else? Those are great points. You won't get called on it. It's okay. You're the doctor, you're important. What else? It's okay not to introduce everybody, including your co-facilitator. Okay, so there's a lot of lessons. Doctors are busy people. We don't need to explain or apologize. Um, whatever faculty are doing in the moment is more important than what other people are doing. Um, other healthcare professionals, it was a social worker, they're not as important as the doctor. They don't even get introduced. Um, and importantly, that they acquiesce to this because they also didn't speak up and say, hi, this is who I am. Um, the, the idea that we've heard it all before, we don't really need to pay attention to what the patient's saying. Um, students don't really need to give feedback. We don't care what they think anyways and no one should really say anything about what they observed. So despite the formal curriculum being about patient-centered communication and the informal part about it being, maybe it'll play out differently in the different groups, it's kind of unscripted, what's really problematic here is the hidden curriculum. So who thinks what the physician did is um, unprofessional? Okay, why? Kind of obvious, but disrespectful, rude, someone said. Um, does anyone think it wasn't or that there's a potential way this is not unprofessional? Well, sometimes people will say things like, well, what if it was a really um, important patient matter? You know how sometimes when you're teaching and your team is texting you or this is like the one time that the surgeon is out of the OR and sends you the update and you don't want to miss it, would that make it less problematic? No? Yes? Can I? Why? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a great point is that um, we don't really know what the physician was doing. Yes, the not introducing people and all of that was kind of, there's not really a good excuse for that. But the iPhone part, maybe there was a good reason for that. And maybe, um, maybe there's more to it than just the behavior. So let's just kind of keep that in mind. So the definition of professionalism, I'm not really going to get into because it's surprisingly difficult for people to pin it down. We can all agree on the core elements like respectfulness and putting your patients first and reliability and accountability. But there's a lot of variation in the emphasis and interpretation depending on who you ask, uh, different um, cultures within the profession, different disciplines, if you ask the patients, if you ask ourselves, if you ask our regulating bodies. Um, and that's why there's hundreds, literally hundreds of definitions out there. What some of us tried to do a few years ago 
is to look at the ways in which people were talking about professionalism. So I was very lucky to be led by Brian Hodges, who's at the Wilson Centre in Toronto. Um, and we were part of an international working group that was struck uh, prior to 2010 for a conference called the Ottawa Conference. And what we did is we looked at all the literature that was looking at the assessment of professionalism and looked at how people were talking about it. And we found that there were three main discourses. A discourse can be a way of talking or kind of a lens with which things are viewed. And the main one was that professionalism is seen as an individual behavior or a trait or characteristic. A different perspective is that it's all interpersonal. It arises from the relationships between people. And a third perspective is that it's socially determined and associated with institutions and society. And what's important is that each perspective, whichever one you're looking at, it makes certain things visible and other things less visible or invisible. So for example, if we look at it through socially determined phenomena with institutions and society, it helps us understand the systems factors that may relate in unprofessional behavior, but it may detract from focus on the individual. What we saw far more often is that all the focus is on the individual and we rarely pay attention to these other factors. And this is my shout out to Rose. This, I put this article up because this proves how long, actually we've known each other for much longer than that, um, and other uh, UBC colleagues. But we started a research program looking at professionalism with that focus. We thought the problem was, is we don't really have good evaluations or assessments of the learners, and that's why unprofessional behavior exists. Um, and this was obviously a naive view to take that long ago. But our initial concern was that there was not enough focus on behaviors. People were still talking about assessing attitudes and values and character. Um, and we thought behaviors are so much more objective because surely everyone can agree on what they've seen and you can look at what people do and maybe not worry so much about what they think. And we also were concerned that they didn't take the context into account. So behaviors be, may be more or less appropriate depending on where you are and who you're talking to. The assessments at the time also didn't allow for the idea of values conflict. So let's say you have an issue like honesty and confidentiality. So those are both equally worthy values, but sometimes you have to make a decision maybe to tell a lie to protect patients' confidentiality, and sometimes it's the other way around. So there's no kind of set hierarchy of which value trumps the other ones. And so we don't really take into account what do people do when there's two equally worthy values at stake and then how do they resolve that conflict. And we also thought at the time it was kind of too abstract and top down. So what we did is we embarked on a series of studies to try to understand it more from the bottom up. We also looked at what are the common assessment methods, and I've added to this slide over the years as we've come up with more and more ways of assessing professionalism. What, what do these tend to have in common? Does anyone notice anything? Well, for one thing, the focus is on the individual. Um, and for another thing, almost all of them have in common that there's someone is judging someone else's behavior and assigning some sort of rating to it. And so this is really interesting that this is still the state now and we'll get into why that may be an issue. So I'm going to show you a short video clip and I'm going to ask you to um, think about it as it's playing and think about um, what the medical student should do. So the video clip is of a medical student coming at the end of rounds. She's with it's a surgical rotation. Are we all internists here? Can we poke a little fun at surgery? Okay, so it's a surgical rotation at the very end, and she's concerned about a patient and brings it up with the surgeon that she's rounding with. So think about what the student should do, why she should do it, and what do you think would happen, and then think about what might that depend on? What are some of the elements in the context that might change what you think? And this is the part where we all cross our fingers and hope the video plays. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. So the last patient is Mrs. Yesarian. She's a day six post liver transplant, but she's doing really well. She's eating and drinking, but she hasn't been told about her test results yet. So are we going to tell her today? Tell her that the chest x ray showed a big lung tumor. 
it wasn't picked up pre-op. Nobody's told her. Every day she asks me if her tests are okay. I don't know what to tell her. Well, we'll leave that up to the hepatology team. We were responsible for her surgery and her post-op care, but any other issues should be dealt with by our medicine team. Uh, we don't want to get involved with that. Okay. It's just that she's so happy about getting the transplant. She thinks that she's going to be okay now, and maybe that's not realistic. Is it fair for us to keep this information from her? Well, that's the OR. I have to go. Just go in the room and check her uh, wound, and uh, I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> You tell me. You look pretty good. Any diarrhea, nausea, vomiting? Any pain in the incision? No, all that's fine. I'm feeling all right, all things considered. Can't wait to get out of here, though. What do my tests show? Okay, I like that. I like the handy. Oh, that's the OR. Got to go. Um, so, uh, the patient asks. What do my tests show? Uh, what should the student say? I know a lot of people usually start with, well, she shouldn't have gone in the room in the first place, but she is, and the patient asked her this question. Any ideas? What she should do or maybe what she shouldn't do? Well, she should say there's something abnormal in the x-ray, which I'll discuss with my attending. There's something abnormal, which I will discuss with my attending. OK. And what might happen next if she says that? A lot of questions from, from the patient. OK. Yes, and she might focus and worry about the abnormality until the attending comes back. What are some other possibilities? The student may be recommended for giving information or alluding to some abnormal abnormality. Yeah, so she could get in trouble. And and why would, would people be upset about that? Because according to her attending, she was overstepping her boundaries in terms of surgery rotation, okay. internal medicine. So it's overstepping her boundaries within her within the scope of the surgery rotation her attending. Already said it's not our responsibility. Right. Someone else's. Right. So the patient might also be upset that finding out on day five or whatever it is that no one has told her for so many days. What are some other options? What else could the student do? Or not do? Okay. She is. She is. Okay. Any more? Yeah, and they may also feel like they've made it worse. Yeah. These are all, so it is a tough situation. I don't know if people caught the, the fake name of our um, patient. Sorry, I'm trying to move this over so I can be in two places at once. But it was a Yossarian, which is the name of the, one of the main characters in Catch-22. And that was the, the, the filmmaker that actually gave that name. Okay, so when we looked at what, how our students responded, we did a, we've done this in a whole bunch of studies, actually, with uh, medical students at the clerkship level, pre-clerkship level, and we've also now had it translated, and they've done similar studies in Taiwan and in Italy. But what we found at first was that it wasn't so much the behaviors that were interesting as what was the motivation behind the behaviors. So people were motivated based on either considering and articulating a principle that they thought was at stake, by an affect, so kind of their inner gut feeling of what they just felt was the right thing to do, or by considering an implication or consequence of their action. And they could think about all these things together. But when it came to the principles, our initial group of students thought about things like patient care, 
being fair to the patient, and things like that that we considered a vow. This is kind of formal curriculum stuff. This is what is what we're supposed to be doing as a profession. Some of the other ones, like obedience, deference to your attending or to someone who might know better, allegiance to the team, um, or a principle of getting a good education, which comes up a lot for students, we called those unavowed because they were not explicit. They're not explicit in the curriculum, but they're very well understood and tacitly accepted. And when we looked at the implications, we could say, considering implications for the patient, surely that's avowed. Considering implications for other people, like what might happen to the attending, or it makes the team look bad, or it can undermine relationships, those are also important for functionings of the team, but are unavowed. But then we thought, when students really thought about themselves, I could get in trouble, what could happen to me, we called that disavowed, because we actively tell students they're not supposed to think about themselves. This is kind of the opposite of altruism. We're supposed to put patients first, we're not supposed to consider ourselves in the equation. And that turned out to be maybe a little bit too harsh of a view at the beginning. But what was really interesting is after we had a series of videos, we had five of them. So at the end of the study, when they've done all their five videos, the students always ask, well, did I get the answers right? And they were still at a stage where they said, what was the right answer? What are you supposed to do in that situation? And we thought, well, that's a really good question. We should find out what faculty think is the right answer. So we did another study where we interviewed about 30 uh, faculty from internal medicine and surgery, and we showed them the same videos, and we asked them not what you would do if you were the student. We just said, what do you think a student should do? Because we were hoping to get some consensus, and we were hoping to turn this into an exam. None of that happened because there was no consensus. So when we looked at this, I'm sorry this doesn't project better, but we found that mostly it reinforced with the students also how the students responded. But there was a couple of key differences. One is when when the students talked about disclosure and honesty, Faculty talked as well about behaving honestly, but they also said that students should know when to fudge. And that was interesting. And when, we came, when it came to obedience, deference, and allegiance to your team, faculty turned this into an imperative to know your place. And students should, and someone said that as well, which sometimes means doing what you're told, but also knowing your limits and when you shouldn't do what's beyond your limits. And also, they should know when to step up to the plate and when you need to not obey someone who's told you to do something that may be unethical or unprofessional. And the thing that was really striking about this is the fact that there was so little consistency between the different videos we had them watch and between faculty. Some said do one thing, some said do another thing. And even for the same person, in different scenarios, they would argue for the opposite of what they had already argued. And the the thing is that they were really placing a lot of it on the students' shoulders, and that's what we called, this was a quote from the study, students should know when to rock the boat and when not to rock the boat. We thought this was maybe a little unfair. But I'll show you an example. This is, I wish I was actually related to uh, the notorious RBG, but I love this, I love the judgy face. So this is an example from that scenario, how we can see some inconsistencies. So the faculty in this case said, what the student should absolutely not do is say everything's okay, because that's actually lying. Everything is not okay. And lying is morally wrong and never the right thing to do. So that was pretty clear. But later, in the same interview, (laughs) the same person said, well, the student could say that with regards to the surgery, everything's okay. I could see her giving an answer like that, and I don't think that would be absolutely wrong, because withholding information is not actually lying or misrepresenting the truth, right? So we can see that the principle of honesty can be argued in different ways. And this is not new. We actually found there were a lot of studies, and they continue to be um, published from time to time, that look to see in, let's say, medical students or residents or faculty, what, how can, they can tweak scenarios to get people to say when they would lie or when they would use um, deception on an insurance form to get a test covered. Um, In error disclosure literature, there's also a bunch of this. But we actually thought that our question was easier because we weren't asking people what they would do. We were asking the faculty, what do you think a student should do? And we were really surprised to see so much flexibility in the definition and application of principles like honesty. So the key lessons we learned at that point were that 
Translating an abstract ideal like honesty into a concrete behavior is not an easy process. But the flip side of that means that the behaviors themselves may not be obvious or transparent indicators of someone's professionalism. And I'll show you what I mean. So let's say in the scenario, the student had Dr. A. And Dr. A sees the situation this way. The student could obey the, obey the surgeon and lie to the patient or disobey the surgeon and disclose the diagnosis. That's kind of how he was framing it. And what Dr. A said is, the student has been asked a direct question. The student knows the result. Essentially, to not tell the truth about the result would, in my mind, be incorrect. So that's Dr. A. The student might instead have Dr. B as her attending. And Dr. B sees it this way. The student could tell the truth about the test and risk distressing the patient because she's not equipped to answer all the questions. Or she could lie to the patient to spare her feelings, at least for the time being, while she gets more help to solve the situation. So according to Dr. B, students shouldn't give patients information that they can't adequately discuss. So giving half the information is worse than not giving any information, as far as I'm concerned, right? So let's say there's no question that these both involve honesty and disclosure and things like that. But how would they evaluate this student? If the student decided not to disclose and to fudge and to maybe tell a little white lie while she goes to get more information or more help, and she has Dr. A as her attending, Dr. A is going to ding her for professionalism because he said, you knew the information, you lied to the patient. Kind of a black and white situation. She has Dr. B. Dr. B is going to give her a good mark for professionalism, not because she's going to forgive the lie, but because she actually thinks that's the right thing to do in that situation. So this is a problematic situation for our, our residents and our students. And the key lessons here is that if we look at only the behavior, if we only focus on what did the student actually do in the situation, and we don't consider the whole context and all the ways that there are values conflicts and what was going through her mind and who told her to do what, and maybe that attending surgeon wasn't so nice and was like angry and yelled at her not to tell the patient, like we don't know the whole situation. But what we do is we completely discount all that contextual information, and we pretty much assume that all the decision-making power in that situation is within the person. And we attribute behaviors to the person, and we ignore the context. And this has actually been a really, really well-recognized thing in social psychology going back like 50 years, um, which I kind of wish we had known before we started our research because people pointed it out. And it's just one of those lessons that you find something in a, in a field and you don't know that they talk about it in another field, maybe using different language in another way. And then once you make that link, it can make your research stronger. Um, and it turns out there is a ton of literature showing that the relationship between people's attitudes and how they ultimately behave is really complex. And people will generally act in accordance with their beliefs and attitudes, but it's very subject to external influence. And there's a couple of good references here. One is a huge meta-analysis of like 800 studies. But what it turns out that when the social pressure to act in a certain way is high and the required behavior is difficult, then the person's own attitudes and beliefs account for a very small proportion of the variance in behavior. And most of the way people behave is dictated by the social pressure, the situation, and the difficulty of the behavior. So this is a problem because it makes us be a little bit concerned about who we should be worried about. Is it the person that does the right thing, maybe for the wrong reasons? Or is it the person who has maybe done an incorrect behavior, but maybe had good reasons or good rationales? And we don't really know that. But also, we really ignore the context almost completely when we're evaluating people's behaviors. And we found the same thing in practicing physicians. I did some studies with the American Board of Internal Medicine a few years ago with practicing physicians. Um, this was in Philadelphia. We did a bunch of focus groups, and we put together similar scenarios that we thought would be challenging for practicing physicians, like uh, being asked we, this happens all the time. Can you just write me a prescription? My doctor's out of town from their secretaries or colleagues. Or being asked to suddenly absorb a lot of patients because someone's retiring or moving. Or do you give your email out to patients or not? Um, and then there was the one someone mentioned this morning about the uh, being uh, suddenly concerned about a colleague who you wonder if they're slowing down and maybe should retire. So kind of typical scenarios. 
We found out that when we presented these scenarios to focus groups, the, the big answer was it depends. There were principles that they sort of used as guiding principles, but they were quite variable. They were, of course, concerned about patient welfare. Um, they were concerned about financial reimbursement. This was in the U.S., and they, are small, they run small businesses in their practices. They were concerned about time and efficiency, work-life balance. Um, when is it time to not follow evidence-based medicine rules and guidelines and sort of bend them or break them because this patient might be different? Um, is this my patient or not my patient? Is it a colleague's patient? Is it a colleague, a friend, a neighbor? Um, and they also had a desire to keep their patients happy because thinking that they want to have a good rapport and have their patients come back to see them again. But these were all really modifiable. A lot of the, um, the principles were not really hard and fast rules, but they could be greatly altered by things like um, their relationship. How well do I know this person? How well do I know this patient? What's the risk of danger or harm if I do it or don't do it? Am I really familiar with this scenario and should I get involved? What was interesting, they also talked about the type of patient. Is this a compliant patient? One of the nice ones that you like to see every day or is this that one that always challenges whatever you do? I'm seeing some nodding heads. People don't usually talk about this, about patients they like and patients they don't like. It was kind of interesting. Is this a patient that's respectful to you or not? And the ones that are nicer and more accommodating, people tend to break the rules for more. They also considered the nature of the illness. Is it physical or mental? Is it narcotics? That's a totally different category. Um, what's the sensitivity or stigma around it? So this just went to show that we had these scenarios and people were all over the map about what they thought the right thing to do was. And we started doing this because the ABIM wanted to have some kind of self-assessment of professionalism as part of the maintenance of certification. But what we found was that there was just no way that people were ever going to agree on what's the right thing to do. And it's really hard to make some kind of exam that has all of these um, contextual contingencies and it depends in there. Um, and then for other reasons that we probably shouldn't talk about, the ABIM program has been scrapped. Um, but this all reminds us that this is what we do as human beings. This is not about being physicians or clinical supervisors. As human beings, we do this. We underestimate the environment or context, and we think all the behaviors that people that we see people do are just completely within their powers, and they can either choose to do them or not do them. And we also interpret what we see through our own lenses. I don't know if you noticed in the quotes I showed you, someone said, in my mind, this is the right thing to do, or as far as I'm concerned. And we recognize that we're all people and we all have different ways of seeing the world. That's fine as people, but when we're the clinical supervisors and evaluators, this contributes greatly to the hidden curriculum. There's all these things that students might be learning, including... Maybe it's not about rules or guidelines. It's about, are you working with Dr. Ginsburg or Dr. Hadala? That's not a really good hidden curriculum to have. They're way better off with you, Rose. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so I highly recommend this paper written and uh, published in 2015 by my friends Tina Martimianakis and Fred Hafferty et al. And it was a really in-depth scoping review of the literature on the hidden curriculum. And while it might not seem so interesting to have done that, they came up with some, first of all, it's beautifully written as a paper, but some really interesting ways that we might think about the, the state that we're in now. So one of the things they wrote is that in more recent years, so they looked back over, I think, 20 years, the references to the hidden curriculum in the literature do reflect an appreciation that individual behaviors are a product of complex social and political relations involving institutions and organizations, and this has implications. So it's good that we're actually really explicitly recognizing the forces at play. But they also noted that in the literature, most of the focus is really negative. Mistreatment, poor role modeling, ethical erosion that's written about, and so all the interventions are aimed to try to understand and then contain these factors. They also wrote that a medical student can either retain his or her humanistic qualities or become enchained by the noxious tangles of the hidden curriculum. And I thought that was really interesting and kind of bleak, that the two choices are either you maintain the humanism you came in with or you get caught up and affected by the hidden curriculum which really, 
that, that, that equation doesn't leave any room for growth, actually having your humanism and ethical behaviors and everything actually improve while you're in medical school. But it also has a view to it, and this is, again, not, not what they think. This is their base, basis on the literature, um, is that the hidden curriculum is written about as something that is kind of done to students, and it's something that happens to them. And it doesn't really take into account the agency that students might have and that we often discount. So what were some of the solutions they found in their review? They would focus on either the objective, the mode or format of the intervention, or who's being targeted. And the objective was usually to enhance things, like enhance students' humanism, enhance faculty humanism, um, have courses or, or sessions on arts and the humanities, so to try to dilute the hidden curriculum. They talk about whether they should be elective, because in a lot of places they'll have these as electives but not be part of the formal curriculum, and that in itself is a hidden curriculum about what do we actually think is important. And they also talked about who's being targeted. Is it students, faculty, or the system? And no surprise, it's usually students who are targeted as the, um, as the agents of change. But what's missing in a lot of this literature is how these enhanced, these humanistically enhanced students and faculty are supposed to thwart the elements of the embedded hidden curriculum. And they talk about how we can move towards this idea that it's not about vanquishing noxious elements, uh, but more about allowing positive influences to flourish. And it kind of reminds me of the way that we talk about burnout and resilience and wellness. It has a lot of parallels. Like we talk about making students and learners more resilient so they can sort of withstand and stay healthy during this noxious training that they get. They use the word noxious a lot in the paper. <laughs> um, and, and so there, there again, there are parallels to being focused on the individual rather than being focused on the systems or other issues. And one of the issues they think is really missing is not just systems things like how do you make your ward more humane and all the things that we try to do all the time, but higher level things like payment structures and the way hospitals are literally built and the architecture and the way that everything works that sometimes works against humanistic care of patients, like having patients in a hallway and things like that. We don't really address those at all. So what we're doing now is we're revisiting this Ottawa framework. Um, we All the groups that did these um, kind of, um, poli not policy papers, they were sort of uh, working group papers mm -hmm. on what we thought the future of assessment was in all these different domains. And all the groups were asked, if we wanted to come back together and see if there's any updates. And of course, we thought this would be a great opportunity to look and see what has changed since we got together um, nearly 10 years ago. And that work is in progress. Um, but what we found is we looked at the recommendations that we made, and I don't intend for everyone to read all these. Some of these have actually been taken up. So we recommended that there wasn't nearly enough literature from other cultures and contexts, and it was very sort of North American and Anglo-centric. And we've seen actually an explosion of articles from other places that sometimes challenge what we think of as professionalism in our system. So that has been really interesting. One of the things that's sadly still really missing is this one, to develop and evaluate means of incorporating patients' perspectives into the assessment of professionalism. And this has been called out over and over again that, as something that's missing. And we can only speculate as to why no one's really going out and doing this difficult research. So I'd like to, I'm going to end in a couple of minutes. One thing that came out in um, JAMA a few years ago was, again, from uh, my colleagues at the ABIM, was that we should start thinking about professionalism as a systems issue, kind of like how we moved from thinking about um, medical error, which we don't even call it medical error anymore, really. It's patient safety and quality. And it used to be uh, sort of the who did it, what was wrong with that person, you know, teach them or get rid of them. And then it moved into really thinking about it as there's a lot of systems issues that result in errors occurring and looking at it from that perspective. And they thought we should be doing the same with professionalism. And I like how they put the physician-patient interaction at the center of this. And there's all these ways that professionalism can be expressed, including going right out to things like payment and regulation. And these are all things that actually influence this relationship. So that it's important that we ultimately remember that when our learners, our colleagues, ourselves, um, 
demonstrate what look like lapses in professionalism. That is mostly that we're dealing with good people in difficult situations. And we have to keep remembering that mostly people went into medicine for the right reasons and they want to keep those right reasons. And it's not like the hidden curriculum is this horrible bad thing that just happens to people and everyone misbehaves. But we have to remember that people are usually trying to do their best. And we also have to remember that there's a high proportion of comorbidity in people that display repeated lapses in professionalism. We found in our own data at U of T, looking back at about 10 years of residents that were referred to the Board of Examiners for issues with professionalism, that about two thirds had some significant comorbidity like a physical illness, a mental illness, a major life stressor going on that they didn't tell anybody about. And that it's obviously much easier to behave professionally in an environment or culture that fosters it. And I would be really happy to hear your thoughts on how we can achieve that. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open uh, the floor for questions. We have a bit of time. And if you could, when you ask a question, if you could um, press that little button in front of your chair because it's being broadcasted to other listeners. Dr. Dota. I mean, Dr. Peter Dota. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this, just what you're getting at at the end here is sort of the positive side as opposed to the negative disciplinary side. We hear so much about discipline mm -hmm. at the student level at the practicing position. Are there examples, I mean, of the positive deviance, which is a strategy that's been used to change behaviors in other areas mm -hmm. outside medicine? Are there examples like that that, have, that are either in progress or have been assessed that, that might be demonstration of progress for us um, in, in departments of medicine and faculty? Yeah, the, the yeah that, that's a great question, and that has been done. So some people have really looked at the appreciative inquiry uh, way of doing things. So rather than asking your learners, you know, what went wrong this week or having like M&M rounds, they give positive examples, and it does a, a bunch of things, including um, getting people to focus on and remember all the many positive things that they've seen. And students and residents will talk about things like, they saw the chair of medicine go and refill a water glass for a patient, and that had a big impact, or holding the door open or helping the janitor carry something. And that reminds them, because sometimes you just remember the negative examples and you don't remember all the positive. And one school, the University of um, uh, Indiana, did that as a broad project through all five of their major campuses. And these kind of started from the ground up and they got people writing about things. And they took a whole appreciative inquiry approach and they've written about it and they've managed to, as they claim, they've managed to really change the culture into one of a more positive humanistic environment. It's hard work, but I think it's possible. Dr. Tanya. Uh, uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, the interaction of the physician with the patient or the student. <laughs> But sometimes uh, interprofessional, say within a division or a department or between departments, there are professional issues that will affect patients. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any information about that? Uh, yeah, so the issues that occur between departments and between people in different departments, is that what or you're... Within your, yes. And how that affects patients. Yeah, there's some people that have written about things like... Um, what they call turf wars, like when, when people are arguing about, is this medicine, is this surgery? And first of all, patients, no, that never happens. Um, patients um, that have been interviewed and studied, they know when this is happening, and they know when they're being bounced from person to person and feeling like no one really wants to take care of them and that they are the problem. So that really does have a, a potentially very toxic effect. And also we see that a lot of the a lot of the conflicts we see in medicine do occur between the residents and they occur on call at night. And there are people that sometimes I hear stories in the morning and I was like, no, not my resident. My resident is so nice and so sweet. And it's just the fact that when it's three o'clock in the morning and it's their like 18th consult and the last three times they tried to get surgery, surgery yelled at them and hung up the phone. And this time they called and they were the angry one. And I can totally see how that happened. And I don't blame my resident at all. But from that person's point of view, who's only encountering them for the first time, they're like, what's wrong with you? Your resident is so horrible. And then you have to kind of take that apart and have a 
conversation, not when they're post call and talk about, you know, what are some, you know, I totally understand why you were frustrated. I would have been too. What are some other ways you could have handled that um, that might have had a better outcome? But that's a big source of the conflicts that we see amongst our residents. I think that resonates with a lot of people in this. Yeah, room. I'm sorry to pick on surgery. I actually have really good friends that are surgeons. They're just kind of an easy target, and that's very unprofessional of me. Yes. <laughs> you for that question. It is something that um, I, I do often when I do workshops with residents is that um, I tell them about the times that I've done that. So uh, I, I do tend to have my phone out a lot and I've been called out on that by the residents. Um, but so th there's some simple things like there was a time that I was actually, it's just freakishly coincidental, but I was actually giving a workshop at Academic Half Day on Professionalism. And my father had just been admitted to the hospital, and I had my phone out, and I use that as an example to say, okay, I have my phone out, I keep checking my texts, the reason I'm doing that is because, and I said, so a simple thing, like me just being honest about what's going on in my life can make you guys then not complain that I was on my phone while I was giving a workshop. And it was actually true. And then another example that I... <laughs> that. I've given was the, um, and I didn't include it because I didn't think we'd have time, was that I had these two different residents working on my team at the same time. And one of them was just like, sort of came in on time, uh, but like was always kind of coming in with, you know, and then was going to go to his locker and put his stuff away. And he would always leave at five and always went to every half day in every session. And then my senior resident was always coming in early and staying late and would always take care of everything before signing over and would always kind of have looked through all the labs before morning report. And so guess which resident I liked better. But then I realized that I was part of the problem because some people pointed out to me, um, why is she coming in early and staying in late every night? Um, is she is she really just altruistic and putting patients first and such a great doctor or is there something going on at home that she's avoiding? Is she inefficient and things just take her longer? Is she one of those people that can't let go and we're gonna she's gonna burn out? And I realized that what I was doing is I was like implicitly condoning all of that because I kept thanking her for doing all this stuff that made my life easier. And so once I sort of thought more about what I was doing and she was and then maybe she was just doing sort of impression management because she saw that I liked it so she kept doing it so yeah we are we are part of that hidden curriculum and it takes a bit of work um, and you have to make yourself vulnerable to be able to say I made a mistake or this is what I've done or or being explicit about what you're doing so maybe we could we could all do more of that Thank you very much. One, one question I have, uh, when you were talking about the students at the beginning, one of the statements was a student should know his or her place. Yeah. And so I'm curious even what that means. Does that mean the student is subservient? Does that mean the student shouldn't say anything because he or she should speak to somebody else first? Mm -hmm. or this, and or the student, if he or she feels that it's time to say something, should go ahead and say it. So I, if you, even the interpretation of the statement, like, a student should know his or her place. I don't know how to interpret that. Right, and, and I'll bet you this, the students don't either because they're expected to do all of those things in the right way, in the right place, in the right time, with the right tone of voice and with the pr proper amount of deference. And, and some people do it naturally. There's some people that are just more comfortable and others that aren't. And the same student, two different students can do the same approach and in one student it's going to go over well and in another student it's not. And so it does put them in an impossible situation. But we do expect students to kind of know what the role of a student is and that they shouldn't, um, you know, undermine what a physician, a t attending physician has told the patient, and they shouldn't, uh, you know, make their resident look bad on rounds by correcting them. And we expect those kinds of behaviors. 
but I think it's more that we're putting students in a position where we expect that they know when to speak up and when not to speak up. And this is impossible. It's really impossible. I think we just need to encourage. And one of the things that I've learned recently is that someone advised me that when you have a student who seems to be just speaking up all the time and they're acting as if they're already the senior resident, is that problem is going to go away as soon as they are the senior resident. Like some people just are kind of running before they can walk and they'll kind of grow out of it. And it's not necessarily problematic behavior. They're just kind of like in the wrong stage. So anyways, I just put that out there. Are there any other questions? Dr. Romani. So, yeah, so are there gender differences and do we have plans to look at any? We've never looked for gender We always, you know, collect the gender of people when we do our studies, but in small qualitative studies, you're never really going to see major differences and they're not designed to do that. Um, I don't know. I haven't really seen any writing about that. I know that, like, we're looking actually, the work that I'm doing, looking at um, qualitative assessments, so the assessment comments that we write, on our in-training assessment reports and what students and residents write about faculty is we are starting to see some gender differences there, but not necessarily specifically related to professionalism. We also haven't yet asked patients, and this is one thing that I'm finally um, happy. I have a master's student who's going to be doing the same study with the same kinds of videos and asking patients, uh, what would you want the student to do? Would you, would you have wanted them to tell you or not tell you? Um, and we're also using it as an opportunity to try to understand, do they actually know what a medical student is? Do they know what a resident is? Do you expect them to behave like doctors? Do you cut them slack because you think they're only students? So hopefully by this time next year, I'll have more to say on that. Do we have any from the remote sites? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Dr. Halperin has another question. I'm curious, when you were, you were discussing with the physicians what things came to their minds, and one of the things I didn't see, which I thought I would, is how stressful is this going to be for me? In other words, if I'm going to talk, I have mm-hmm. a colleague who I don't think is you know, doing as well as he or she should be, or if I'm going to assess the student and say that he or she isn't as good for a whole bunch of reasons, this comes back on me as well. So it's a lot easier for me to stay away from it. I'll sleep better. Does that ever come up in any of the discussions? Yeah, it, it comes up a lot. And it's one of the things that people don't really like to talk about because we know it's our responsibility. If you get if you get a group of your fellow are there learners in the room? Maybe don't listen to this. Okay. So when you get a group of attendings together and we talk about um, oh, this person is really below standards and they were just kind of a nightmare and I had to watch them like a hawk, and then we pass them anyways. The reason is because the hassles of having to go through failing someone or putting them on a remediation plan, um, it's extra work, it's stressful. I did, uh, half of my PhD was about face saving in situations. We don't want to make people feel bad. We also don't want to feel bad during or after these interactions. Um, It's a huge issue. And I think it's a, a probably unrecognized issue because Everything tells us, everyone knows what we should do. Everyone knows we're not really doing that. And a lot of the interventions are just keep telling us what we should be doing, which is what we already know. And nothing is really looking at why is it so hard and how can we get at the why and make it easier rather than just telling us what to do over and over again. That's a great point. So question of your day. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the OR. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Values or 
Wow, that's such a powerful and thoughtful question. It is true, and that's been shown in a bunch of really interesting studies. There was one that actually followed around four different medical teams for a month, and the um, juniors on the team just kind of took on the personality of the senior, including their use of derogatory language. There was one team where it never happened because the senior never did it and never allowed it, so no one on the team did it. So even in a short period of time, that imprinting can have a big effect. I think, um, you know, obviously it's easy to stay, you know, stay true to yourself and be resilient and remember your, the reasons you went in into it, but you are unfortunately sometimes judged and influenced by the people above you and around you, and you may not um, you may not agree with their behaviors and their attitudes. And sometimes you have to uh, gently find a way to challenge it um, and to find other people to talk to to maybe figure out if there's a way to have a group approach. You know, I'm not talking about someone who's like really horrible, toxic. There's probably all kinds of mechanisms and procedures for that. But the what we call like the microaggressions, the people that make offhand comments that are offensive, that there are strength in numbers and talking to your colleagues and friends about what to do, going to who's the chief resident here. You probably hear this from, from mm -hmm. learners and thinking about ways to solve them. But it's a really, it's a tough situation. Sometimes people just say, you know what, it's just a month. Just put your head down, get through it. Next rotation will be better. That's not a very good attitude, but that's often what people hear. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Who has a better answer than what I just gave? Because that sucked. Rose, do you have a better answer? Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the the answers to that is um, when you're a resident or a medical student, you're working with a lot of different people, and you may like some behaviors or patterns of practice that your attending does, and you don't like some. And my take is I know people like some parts that I do and some parts that I don't. Uh, that I some things that I do and some things <laughs> that I don't do well. But I also always tell people is you don't have to like everything that I do. You'll get to pick and choose what you like, and eventually, when it's your turn to go, you'll hopefully have picked up mm. the nice parts that you that you've enjoyed with your different attendings, and then that's going to be who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think inevitably there's always going to be some good and bad with everyone, mm -hmm. and you know if you stay true to yourself, you're going to be able to pick out what is good and bad with everyone, and eventually, you'll be your own attending, your own person when you actually have a time to be the staff, mm -hmm. be in charge, and not really feel the pressure of someone judging you at all time and, you know, having that evaluation at the end of the month, right? You always have an evaluation yeah. at the end of the month. I don't, yeah. look, at, I don't look at them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Now we know. Yeah. So I think we're at the end of our time. Um, so I'd love for everyone to give a round of applause for Dr. Ginsburg and to Dr. Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you for And I'm sure she's happy if anyone wants to come down and speak to Dr. Oh, yeah. Ginsburg. And she's also doing a round with the residents at 2 p.m. That was such a hard question at the end. Isn't that a great question? Such a good question. But it's a, I need to have a better answer. No, I think it's still a struggle. It's not still a struggle, yeah. There's no answer. It's a dilemma. Yeah, right. But it's a really acute observation. Thank you so much. I have to go to a meeting. You can end it on a day. No, no, no. I think it's really important. Is somebody going to tell me what to do? Yes, Katrina. You should eat something. Okay. Making sure she's okay. Are you going to? That was amazing. Yes. Be a mint. Yes, that's exactly it. I, just, I, I almost think we need to go back to the and also know yourself. I'm talking about myself. I'm talking about other people. I just want to thank you. And say some more.
really drives <coughs> the stroke here. Yes. What do we talk about? It's like an That's what we yeah. used to call it. Yeah. 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 And I guess, you know, I really understand that there was so much research being done about the art that was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't really talk about it like that anymore. But, you know, when I have my investments, I usually see our great medical students. I always say to them, just watch me. Yeah. And watch me because you know, I'm trying to deal with a a phone call from my kids' school mm -hmm. in a um, family home. Mm -hmm. It's all office stuff, right? Yeah. How, to t how to talk to the this teacher because my kid didn't bring their homework in in the middle of excusing myself from the mm -hmm. patient watching me. Right. It's about watching me. Have to, we all have to be watching ourselves. Not just this. this is not about students, it's about us. Yeah. It's good for you. This is my brother, Peter. Peter Rubik. I think we actually had an email exchange some time about everything care about her time. Oh, okay. It was a long time ago. I wanted to ask you, I, I'm interested in, in uh, physician wellness. I've heard about that they're studying a lot of stress. Anyway, um, and, and one of my uh, uh, collaborators uh, is Elaine Chung, who's working at Middle Eastern, but uh, Jim Moskowitz, a social psychology. They do the parties of positive affect, interpersonal, and they're working with students and with residents. And I uh, do trials, actually, at least. I was just curious whether there's any, any opportunity to maybe some collaboration. You know, we've been doing measurements of moral distress you know, and resilience. Whether there's some relationship. You know, you, you highlighted the problem of measuring depression. I'm very interested in it. And I just wonder, even if you measure some dimensions of it, if you can't measure everything. Um, if there would be some interest in looking at relationships between measures of profession or perceptions of profession by the patients mm -hmm. and, uh, or by the residents and um, moral distress mm -hmm. because you, know, you can imagine how those things might be related. So you know, you want to talk and do it the way you wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. I am aware of a little bit of work looking at this and I can't remember if that got published or not but if you email me um, I'll find it because I thought it was so interesting that um, not all dilemmas are people in terms of the distress they cause. So some things can happen and people are not they're, they can be angry about it but they're not morally distressed. Yeah. 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 They are for some other yeah, types yeah, yeah. of no, there's, there's a spectrum. Yeah. yeah, and that may have some, I think what they were looking at is whether that would have any relationship with um, their own sense of, of um, you know, stuff like that. It was a UK that was looking at. But please email me, it sounds really interesting. Yeah, I mean, Doing some studies, maybe yeah. to tack on a, an additional measure of the metric just to see that the measure of professionals and this associated with some of these other measures of wellness, because that could be a real strong driver to do something about it. Right, It would be leaving the workforce. Yeah, interesting to see what people are doing, but how. And how it just affect the change. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyway, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. We're going to do it at Gail Doding when it's all nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank 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 you.
and so they develop a good sense of each other. And then we do kind of mark the reflections, not of our own students, but of random other students, just to make sure they've actually they've actually done them and they've actually, you know, put some thought into the Sunday dilemma. And what we found is the first couple of years I did it, I was surprised how often that it was a positive cause of it. And I should have said that as well. Like when the theme is professionalism or community, so we expect yeah. And like one or two of us, like, I saw this amazing communication. This neurosurgeon was like so awesome with his patients, and I learned this really neat trick about how to connect with people. And it would be like, so you know, like, yeah, so I think we, we, we don't, and, and we're probably not using them. Well enough, they're going to a lot of trouble to get that aid. I saw you know, nurse do that. The part where I find a little more vulnerability is where's the safety to say, either, oh my god, it's a bad thing and I'm unable to do that, or that's such an awful thing, but I feel a pressure to do it. Right. I tend to be a bit of an overshare, too, because I'm a I tell the kids that all the time. I will, I will debrief when I feel like I've made a mistake. I got once had a really horrible family meeting that just went off the rails, and I told my children that I'm really not proud of how I acted in that meeting. I really let it get to me. I got very abrupt. Um, I wasn't engaged anymore. And I said, I want to talk about what happened, and they were all like, but it's really hard because you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah. Well, you did today, and I want to say thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Mayor Pat Cross again, so it's Christopher Pond. Thank, thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And if you don't say those things, then students will just learn from what you do. Right. And uh, so it's just really important for us all to just be more explicit about what you do. I think it's okay to just make mistakes. It's just okay to talk about it. Yeah. 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 And those, those are the people that get the trouble and yeah. make mistakes and don't declare it. Don't push it. Don't push it. Well, great talk. Thank you. And I'm going to come to the dinner. Oh, good. Oh, good. Be more familiar with me. Oh, yeah. I don't even know who's coming. Oh, good. Thank you. 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 Th
No, I would, that would be easy because I'm on PC. But after that, I'm not on, so it's also easy. Yeah. Yeah. It would be easy to turn off like the very few uh, videos that are very popular. Um, and I'll organize them in what we're going to say. All right. Can we expect it to be rocky in the beginning? Yeah. Well, I have lots of things. <laughs> it's because every, everyone is above expectations. This is Someone left their, no. Is that right? I didn't put my glasses on. No, I know. I noticed they did it.
Your call will be disconnected.